think about how awesome God's love is, as we think about communion, what he did for us on that cross, this next song fits in perfectly called Calvary. Just, just a reminder of how good our God is, that he, he shed his blood, that he broke his body. And as we remember that, as we celebrate that, let's give him praise. This song, Calvary. Savior.
It was a great time of praise this morning. You guys can have a seat. At this time, we'll have our scripture reading. Good morning, church. So today's scripture is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 32. For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we will not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Let's pray. So Lord, thank you for this awesome day. Thank you so much, God, for a building to come to. Thank you for the freedom that we have to come here and worship you. God, we just thank you so much for salvation. Lord, we need a rescuer. God, we have fallen short of your glory, and we thank you that you reached down and saved us, God. Help us to have an eternal mindset. Lord, help us to be a light and a witness. Lord, we just pray for a revival in our country. Lord, and uh, we just pray that it would start right here. It would start right here. And John said it would start with us. Lord, help us to be bold in our faith. Help us to be a light as we go out into the world. Please be with Pastor Dave. We pray that he would not say a word, Lord, but your spirit would speak through him. Lord, help us to focus, help us to learn, help us to grow, and help us to leave here changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate all those that uh, serve the Lord in whatever capacity here at uh, the church, whether it's in the nursery, whether it's cleaning the building, um, greeting, taking care of the refuel cafe, teaching. We are blessed to have... uh, a serving congregation. We're blessed. Uh, our chil- our uh, teenagers went to Passion Camp um, in Daytona Beach, Florida, and came back uh, all excited about Jesus. Nothing greater than that. Um, and then, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, they're going to be sharing from their experiences there. And I encourage you to uh, continue to uh, pray for our youth ministry, our children's ministry. Today, uh, is a special day for us followers of Jesus. In a few moments, we'll observe what is known as Holy Communion, Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper. It's one of two ordinances that we observe at West Hills Community Church. The other ordinance is believer's baptism. And I'm excited. Today, it's who knows what the weather's going to be, but there's 15 uh, anticipating being baptized at the picnic. It's going to be a great day. They each have a God story. Uh, I love them. I talked to some of them on the way out that were saying, I can't wait to be baptized. I prayed about it. I wrestled with it. I'm excited to be baptized. And um, great, great testimonies. Each one has their own God story of how the Lord changed their life by saving them and uh, giving them eternal life. Uh, An ordinance is a directive from the Lord, meaning we got the instructions from the Lord. He tells us, do this, and then he expects that we carry it out. It's not meant to be optional. Before we go any further, let me remind you that in the Bible, there are two prophecies of the advent of Jesus, two comings of Jesus. We celebrate at Christmas time his first advent, his first coming to this earth, where he was born to the Virgin Mary. Jesus, when he came the first time, came for the purpose of going to the cross to die for our sins. He took our place on the cross. That's what it means when we say his substitutionary death. He took our place. He was our substitute. He then, after the cross, rose from the grave after he was buried, and he appeared on the face of this earth for 40 days after his resurrection. And his resurrection body was witnessed by many, many individuals during those 40 days. It offered indisputable proof, first of all, that he was alive and that his death was accepted as payment in full for our sin because we've all rung up a sin debt against God and the only acceptable payment is the death of Jesus. 
The Bible also is filled with references predicting his second advent, his second coming to this earth. Jesus, in what's called the Upper Room Discourse, in John chapter 14 to 16, told his disciples, I will come again and take you to be with me, that where I am, you also may be. He's talking about his second coming, and then he's going to take the church, the bride of Christ, to be with him, to spend all eternity with him. Now, the disciples in Acts 1 watched Jesus ascend right before their very eyes into the clouds, and they stood there awestruck. Who wouldn't be awestruck? Nothing like that ever happened. And the disciples, the angels said to them, hey, guys, quit looking around, quit gawking around. Jesus told you to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The angels also said, this same Jesus whom you've watched go up in the clouds will come again in the clouds. Listen, Jesus is coming a second time. The Bible makes that very clear. Paul wrote of that when he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, I don't want you to be ignorant or uninformed, brethren, about those who have died in Christ. He said, we believe that Jesus is alive and we're going to go to be with Jesus. He's coming back and he'll come back in the clouds and we will see him. So Jesus is coming a second time. And today, we who profess Jesus as our Lord and Savior <coughs> should live with an awareness that he could come at any time. That's how we should be living our lives Paul expected it during his lifetime. He said, we who are alive and remain will be caught up with those who have gone on before us. And so shall we ever be with the Lord and comfort one another with these words. We should never become discouraged by the seeming delay of Christ's return. Peter said, there will be those people that scoff at his return. And there are those people today going, what are you talking about? He promised 2,000 years ago and it hasn't happened. They just wrote it off. He's never coming back. But Peter said, listen, God's not limited by time as we define time. Because in God's sight, a day is as a 1,000 years. And a 1,000 years as a day. Knowing that Christ could come at any moment should cause us, motivate us to live pure lives. Lives set apart to Jesus. Let me ask you, do you really think about the fact that Jesus could come at any time? The Bible says he's going to catch people off guard like a thief in the night, but we don't have to be caught off guard. We know he's coming. And if somebody said to you, if, Jesus, if you knew Jesus was coming next Sunday, what would you do this week differently? Our response should be, I wouldn't do anything differently because I've been anticipating his return. We shouldn't be going, well, I'd start doing a, a cram for my final exam. I'd start reading the Bible. I'd start praying more. I'd start sharing my faith. I'd start living more. We should be doing that now because he could come at any moment. So what exactly does all this have to do with communion? Christians are to gather and to observe communion until Jesus Christ comes. He introduced, Jesus did, instituted this ordinance to commemorate his sacrificial death on our behalf. Through the centuries, Christians have kept this all-important appointment to partake of the bread and the cup. Why do we still today, 2,000 years later, partake of the bread and the cup? First of all, we partake to remember his death. Salvation is a free gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it's by grace you're saved, through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a free gift. And I always say the hardest part of being saved is to humble ourselves and say, I'm not okay. I'm broken. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Because people today want to believe they're okay. Just the way they came into this world and the way they've lived their life. I'm fine. I don't need a Savior. 
We're all sinners in need of a Savior. And salvation is free, but it didn't come cheap. When we eat the bread and we drink from the cup, we're to call to mind the tremendous price that Jesus paid for our salvation. He endured everything that he did leading up to and including his cruel and humiliating death by crucifixion. He went through all that in order to bear his father's full wrath against sin. It's important we never forget what Jesus endured for us, that it never becomes ho-hum, that it becomes mundane, that we lose a sense of appreciation. It was out of Christ's amazing and unconditional love for us that he went to the cross. Because even before the cross, he knew he understood the awfulness of being separated from his eternal father was what was awaiting him when he went to the cross. He prayed in Garden's Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Take Calvary from me if people could be saved some other way. But there was no other way. And Jesus went on and said, not my will, but your will be done. God's will was that Jesus go to the cross. Calvary was God's eternal plan. It didn't happen that man sinned and then God had to scramble and say, now what am I going to do? How am I going to get them reconciled to me? If you read Revelation 13, 8, it says, Jesus is the lamb slain before this world was even formed. In other words, God knew we were going to sin. And he knew our sin would cut us off from him. And he said, you know, the solution to man's sin dilemma is going to be the shed blood, the life of my son, Jesus. He's going to bear man's sin on his own body. Jesus loved you and he loved me so much that he willingly laid down his life for us. He said in John 10, 18, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own choosing. Don't for a moment think that Jesus went kicking and screaming to the cross, saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. He knew that's why he came, to die for you, to die for me. This ordinance also is a time to rededicate our lives. Communion gives us this great opportunity to examine our lives, our current walk with Jesus. What's my walk with Jesus like, my recent walk with Jesus? And I encourage you to pray the prayer that David did in Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and show me if there be anything unclean in my life, and then lead me in the path of righteousness. Lord, I'm giving you permission to look into my life and to show me if there's words that I've spoken, if there's thoughts that I've held, if there's deeds that I've done or things that I haven't done that I should do. Lord, show me that. Listen, we talk about sins of commission, like the things we commit when we speak gossip or profane words or the things we watch. Those are sins of commission. But there's also sins of omission. James says to know to do good and not do it is what? Sin. It's sin. If I know I should read my Bible and I don't, that's sin. If I know I should be praying and I don't, that's sin. If I know I'm supposed to witness and I don't, that's sin. God, show me. Impress on my spirit the sin in my life. And then I want to confess that I want to come clean. As God makes us aware of that, we should confess our sin. That's what the word confess means. But when we pray, God, show me my sin if I've said poor words, sinful words, if I've held sinful attitudes, if I've done sinful things, or I haven't done things that I'm supposed to, show me that. God does, and almost the next word out of our mouth after he shows us is, yes, but... Yes, that's true, but. And then we want to blame it on somebody else. I didn't work eight hours a day because they don't pay me enough. I took that from my company because they have more than enough. I said those harsh words to a family member or to a friend because they provoked me. 
I had those impure thoughts because I saw something I couldn't, and I harbored those thoughts. I didn't read my Bible because I was too, but, 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 and God's going, listen, you asked me to show you your sin. I'm revealing it to you. Now, don't trivialize it. Don't excuse it. Don't rationalize it. Don't project the blame onto somebody else. Take ownership for it. Come clean before me. And here's the beautiful news. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So let's not go to God and go, uh, God, honestly, I can't imagine if I have any sin in my life. That's pride right there. Confess that. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. And then the very next verse in 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess, if we agree with God, we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the good news is when he shows us our sin, we say, God, I'm sorry for it because 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, godly sorrow leads to repentance. He forgives us. I love that song, my sin and my shame don't count anymore. And I've said this numerous times, some here, your sin's public knowledge. It's been in the paper. It's been on TV. People seem to love that when people stumble. And with some of us, we have sin that nobody knows about, but the Holy Spirit's telling us, listen, that's not right. That's not acceptable. That's sinful. My sin and my shame don't count anymore. Calvary covers it all. I think of people in the church and I'm going, wow, that person was a mess. And that person was a mess. And you know what? It doesn't matter anymore. They gave their life to Jesus. Their sin and shame don't count anymore. Calvary covered it all. And then we can have that sweet, uninterrupted fellowship with God. That's why Paul said in verse 28, what Matt read for us, a man should examine himself before he eats and drinks from the cup. The apostle made it clear that it's a serious thing to observe communion in an ill-prepared manner. To just flippantly come in and go, I don't even think about it. I'm just going to eat the wafer and drink the cup and not think about what it represents. At Corinth, many gathered in that town of believers for a love feast. That was the meal before the ordinance of communion. And if you read the earlier verses in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, you want me, you people of Corinth want me to praise you for getting together. I can't praise you for getting together. In fact, it's actually to your harm that you're getting together the way that you're getting together. And then he said, you know, at the love feast, some of you are eating too much. Others of you are drinking too much. And there are others in your congregation, in your flock of that local church in Corinth that are going hungry, that are being neglected. They didn't have food. They didn't have drink. And no one seemed to notice. No one seemed to care about those that didn't have. And no one offered them anything. And Paul said, I can't praise you for gathering together to de eat the bread and take of the cup. I can't do that. In fact, he said to them, you're doing yourselves harm by making a mockery of the Lord's table. This ordinance, communion, offers us a, an opportunity to consider anew all that Jesus Christ has done for us and to ask ourselves, how have I been living for Jesus in the recent past? What's going on in my life? He gave his all. He didn't give us leftovers. He didn't give us a half-hearted effort. He gave his all for us. He gave us the very best. He gave his life. And the old hymn asked, after all he's done for me, how can I do less than give him my best? And live for him completely after all he's done for me. Not partially. Just remember, God told the church, Jesus told the one church, Laodicea, you're lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. You're just kind of going through the motions. And he went on and he said, you make me sick to my stomach. I'd like to spew you out. Are you all in for Jesus? This ordinance gives us an opportunity to forgive one another in the body of Christ. When we become aware that we're holding on to bitterness or feeding resentment toward a brother or sister in Christ, we are instructed to get rid of that, get rid of all bitterness 
And if you read it, it escalates until it becomes malice, which is hatred. I'm bitter, but I'm going to keep feeding it. It's going to uh, fester inside of me until it becomes a strong disdain for the person. Get rid of that, Paul said. Listen, I know you can't imagine it, but sometimes people do things to this pastor that are hurtful or say words that are not kind. I know you can't imagine that, that anybody would ever be mean to Pastor Dave, but it happens. And I've been wounded in the past. There's a great book, and I've said this before, the people that have wounded me the most in my life are other Christians. And I've read where Christians are the only ones that intentionally shoot their own soldiers. But we have to say, Lord, I'm giving it to you. I'm going to refuse to get bitter about it. I have to give it to you. I have to surrender to you. In fact, Paul said, get rid of that. And as Jesus has forgiven us, forgive one another. In a sermon on the mount, Jesus said, if we know we're at the altar, we're trying to worship God and we become aware, the Spirit of God says, you know, he brought that person's name to mind and we're at odds with them. If we know that, we should leave the altar, quit trying to worship God and go to that one and make amends. So today I say, if you become aware of that, then you need to say, Lord, I want to forgive that person. I want to forget. I want to be set free. I don't want to be the prisoner of that. I don't want to be plotting vengeance. I don't want to try to get even. I want to forgive that person because you have forgiven me completely. So if you know that, then forgive that person. And if you're the person, you, the Spirit of God says you offended that person, then after the service sometime this week, go to them and say, I'm sorry that I did that. I'm sorry that I said that. I'm sorry I've been ignoring you, giving you the cold shoulder. The Spirit of God's going to tell you what we're doing in our lives. And Paul said in Romans 12, 18, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all people. It's time to stop being a prisoner of our own ill feelings toward others. We need to surrender our ungodly thoughts because it robs us of peace and joy. And I can point to people that are miserable because they're holding grudges. And the other person they're holding a grudge against is going on with life. And the one holding the grudge is a prisoner. We take communion to obey the Lord's command. He said, do this, Jesus did, in remembrance, eat and drink in remembrance of me. In Jerusalem's upper room, that discourse, chapter 14 to 16 of John, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he went on in that same conversation and said, he that has my commandments, we have his commandments right here in the Bible. He said, he that has my commandments and keeps them, that's the one that loves me. Simply put, if we love Jesus, we desire to follow his instructions. John wrote, here's how we know we love God. We keep his commands, and they're not burdensome. We should always look forward to celebrating the Lord's Supper. And we should never approach the bread and the cup in just the casual, careless manner. Let me pause and ask you to consider. You're the only one that can answer for yourself. What exactly does communion mean to you? Have you allowed it to become routine and, and mundane and meaningless because you're so familiar with it, you've done it so many times, you say, I don't even really give it any thought anymore. It's maybe is it a little more than a ritual for you. Going through the motions, or do you observe it in a manner that leads you to the cross and fills your heart with adoration and gratitude? We sang that last song in both services. I was weeping, going, wow. Our sin and its shame. It's gone because of Calvary. And He keeps on pursuing us and loving us. And He showed that love on the cross. The message of the cross, verse 26, is going to endure until Jesus returns. Times may and do, in fact, change. Boy, these are days that change is going increasingly faster. But the gospel message never changes. 
I want to remind you when you hear that word gospel, what that means. The word literally means good news. Well, what's the good news of Jesus Christ? Paul said it very simply. Some people call it the gospel in a nutshell. It's very succinctly, briefly summed up. Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The Old Testament Scriptures talked about Him dying. Read Isaiah 53. He was buried, and then He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That message never changes. There's but one gospel message. Paul said in Galatians, I'm amazed that you people would try to go back to a work salvation. And he said, there's but one gospel. It's the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And let anybody who tries to preach any other gospel, any other means of salvation than Jesus, let that person be anathema or accursed. Both the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, 6, which says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And Romans 3, 23 in the New Testament, all have sinned and come short of the glory. They state that every single one of us in here, no exception, we're all sinners. And as a result of our sin, we're rendered spiritually dead, cut off from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, your sin has separated you from God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. In Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sins, it shall die. We're cut off. We're spiritually dead. That means this. We are completely incapable of doing anything of ourselves to solve our sin dilemma. When you go and ask people, are you going to heaven? I think so because I'm a good person. I joined a church, whatever. Those are all man-oriented. It would have eliminated the need for the cross if we're going to save ourselves. Jesus left his home in glory. He left where he was worshipped in heaven by the angelic beings in heaven, and he came to this earth to bear our sins on his own body. 1 Peter 2.24, he bore our sins on his own body. On Calvary's cross, Jesus gave his life. He shed his blood to cover your sin. God is holy and just. And he will not overlook sin. People want to emphasize God's love. He is a loving God. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. But he's also holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 says he is holy. And he's also just. And because he's holy and just, he cannot, he will not just overlook our sin, ignore our sin. I'm amazed that seemingly intelligent people fall into the pit of new age and say, there's no such thing as sin. Look at our world. Watch the news. What do you think those things are that are going on? The atrocities being committed. They're, it's sin. But people are trying to downplay it. But Jesus came to this earth because God is not only holy and just, He's loving. He demands that our sin be paid for. And God sent His Son into this world. For John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him, whoever trusts in Him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus died once for sin. The righteous one died for us, the unrighteous, 1 Peter 3, 18, for the purpose to bring us to God. Here we are, Come into this world, we're all sinners, we're cut off from God. Jesus died to bridge the gap between sinful man and a holy God. There's one bridge. There's not a bunch of bridges. And when people say, oh, that's exclusive, who do you think you are? It's not who do I think I am, what does the Bible say? This is God's Word. Do I believe that Jesus is, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If I believe that, then I have to believe what He said. He said, there's no other way. Nobody can come to the Father except by me. Our salvation was purchased at the cross. John the Baptist correctly identified Jesus. John pointed his followers and said, Here he comes, Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Here he is, Jesus. God made it clear, clear back in the Garden of Eden, that he required a blood sacrifice to cover man's sin. But then Cain, he attempted to please God on his own. He said, well, I know I, God wants a blood sacrifice, but I'm bringing him fruit and vegetables. 
And God will accept that. And God said, no, I won't. And Cain grew angry. And God said, Cain, what's the matter with you? If you do right, won't you be accepted? Cain, you know what I want, but you're not cooperating. You're trying to worship me on your own. And that's where people are today. Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Today, the average person says, I think I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. I do good works. Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. In fact, in Isaiah 64, 6, it says, all our efforts at righteousness are like dirty, stinking, filthy rags because of our sin. We can't please God on our own. Some people say, well, if you give money to the church, Peter said, you're not redeemed by silver and gold. Redeemed means bought out of the sin market. You, didn't, you can't purchase your way out of it by silver and gold. You're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by Jesus Christ. People say, if you join a church, listen, it's possible, unfortunately, to be a member of a local church and not a member of God's family. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior then you might be a member of a local church, but you're not a member of God's family. John 1, 12, to as many as received Jesus, to them God gave the right to become, to be called children of God. You have to put your faith in Jesus for your salvation. The cross is heaven's theme song. And I love Revelation chapter 5, 9, and 10. It says, from every language, every tribe, every nation, every people... They'll be around the throne of God singing about the cross. That's why we have missionaries. Because everybody needs Jesus throughout the world. And they need to hear the gospel message. And the cross has and will outlive its critics. To those that are perishing, it's foolishness. But to those that are being saved, it's the power of God into salvation. The power of the cross will radically transform our lives. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. So listen, in this cancel culture, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I was thrilled that our young people got to go. And see, there are other young people. And some others of our young people went to Young Life Camp. It's a blessing to know you're not in it alone. And my prayer is that these young people come back, they're all revved up and they take it into the school year, that they stay revved up about Jesus and they never go back and go, I'm never going to be the same. There are other people who love Jesus and together we can make a difference in our schools, in our communities, in this world. That's my prayer. There were 9,000 young people at Daytona Beach, middle school, high school kids singing praises to Jesus and worshiping Jesus. There were 65,000 in January college-age students worshiping Jesus. There is hope. We should never be ashamed of the gospel. It radically changes lives. And the good news is this. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you are broken and you ask the Lord to forgive you, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Not some sin, all sin. Moses was a murderer. God forgave him. David was an adulterer. Peter denied Jesus. God used all of them to build his kingdom. You, you could have all kind of garbage in your past and all kind of baggage and you say, he, he can't do this. Listen, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. The other day I was with people. One guy had spent time in prison and the other guy was a police officer. I'm like, how cool is that? And then we have a defense attorney. And it's like, it's the body of Christ. We all need a Savior. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's what I love about the body of Christ. Anybody who humbles himself and calls on the name of the Lord can and will be saved. 
Communion will always be relevant. We need to remember the sacrifice Jesus paid for each one of us. And it should cause us to live pure lives. Lives set apart to the Lord. Everybody that has this hope of seeing Jesus again purifies himself even as he is pure. So let me say this as we draw to a close. Can you echo the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1.21 where he said, Listen, to me to live is Christ, and to die is a gain. My whole reason for living is Jesus Christ, and if I die, that's a gain. I just talked to someone whose friend's passing is under care of hospice, and the person's ready to go be with Jesus. He has that peace, that hope. Can you say, when I breathe my last breath, I'm going to be with Jesus? I know that because he saved me. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Communion is more than just eating a, a dry wafer or drinking from a cup. It's a time to offer thanksgiving to God for his saving grace and his mercy. It's a time to praise the Lord for his sacrifice. It's a cause to rejoice in our salvation. That's why some people call it, join us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're celebrating what Jesus did for us. At West Hills, we practice open communion, meaning you don't have to be a member of West Hills Church. There are two requirements. One, you know Jesus as your Savior, and two, that you're willing to examine your life, and if the Lord reveals sin to you, you confess it and ask Him to forgive you and accept that forgiveness. You're invited. In the moment, the deacons will be serving you, and I encourage you to peel the first layer off. It takes some time. If you need help, ask the person next to you. They'll be kind to you and gentle to you. They won't scold you or look at you like, what's the matter? You can't get that little film off of there. So you go ahead and do that, but we're going to ask the deacons to come forward. But let's pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'd be amiss to just assume everyone here knows Jesus. You walked in, you know Jesus. That's my prayer. That's my desire. But maybe you're here and you say, I, I don't know how to have that relationship with the Lord you're talking about. In John 6, 37, he said, the one that comes to me, I'll never turn away. So you can pray a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today I admit I agree that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me, and I'm asking you to come into my life. I'm putting my faith in you for my salvation, and I want to live for you from now on. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer today, you prayed and invited Jesus in your life, I just ask you to slip your hand. Yes, are there any others? I'm not going to point you out. Any others that say, yes, I prayed today. I asked Jesus to be my Savior. Father, we thank you for this beautiful ordinance, this reminder of your great love for us, and Lord, I pray that we would each one pause and thank you for our salvation. And Lord, we would examine ourselves. And Lord, we would come with pure hearts before your table. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the deacons if they come forward at this time. In your hand until we take them together.
going to ask Pastor Steve if he'd ask the Lord's blessing on the bread at this time. God, we just thank you for this moment of just going back and remembering what you've done for us. We thank you that, God, um, you demonstrated your love for us. While we were yet still sinners, Lord, you died for us. We give you thanks for this. We give you thanks for allowing your body to be beaten, allowing your body to bear our sins so that we could have life and have life abundantly with you. We love you, and we thank you for this time of remembering your great love for us. Jesus took the bread, and when he broke it and gave him thanks, he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask Tony if he would ask the Lord's blessing on the cup at this time. Heavenly Father, we just love you so much, and we're so thankful for um, what you did for us. May we think of that not just today, but every day, how much you loved us to give up your son. Um, so I ask a blessing on this cup in uh, remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask that we stand together, and I'm going to ask Keith and Scofie to ask the Lord's blessing in the close of this service. Don't forget our picnic. If you didn't sign up, it's going to be held, rain or shine, and we got a lot of people baptized. You're to bring your own food. If you don't bring any food, there's banana and gob cake and cookies. That's a great diet. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We love you, Lord, for what you did for us on that cross. To atone for our sins, thank you for saving us, for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for this church, Lord. All this in Christ's holy name I pray. Amen.